there's nothing like sex on LSD, as far as I'm concerned. Cannabis truly is a pharmacy and a flower. Survival comes with cooperation. Pleasure is healing. You're being a warrior of the weird. I'm Lex Pelger, Director of Education at CV Sciences, and this is The Lex Files. Trippers often talk about using psychedelics for adventures or for therapy. But what about their power for bonding and relationship building? Charlie Winninger's new book, Listening to Ecstasy, The Transformative Power of MDMA, is about exactly that. Charlie is a therapist in New York City, and he's also a proud psychonaut with a long storied history. I very much enjoyed this conversation with him about the power and importance of relationships and how to nurture them. He explains how chemical assistance from MDMA, psilocybin, and LSD have brought him closer to his romantic partner, and how they integrate those experiences afterwards. Plus, he emphasizes the need for different kinds of relationships, such as the men's groups, which he draws on for other kinds of support. He's a charming speaker with practical advice that applies to everybody, though I know that he had an eye on his fellow baby boomers when he was writing this book. So if you want to strengthen your relationships and your social awareness, either with drugs or sober, I know you'll learn from this conversation with Charlie Winninger. Hello, everybody. I'm very pleased to be here with my old friend, Charlie Winninger, author of Listening to Ecstasy, The Transformative Power of MDMA. Thanks for coming on the show. Thank you, Lex, for having me. The first thing I wanted to say is great work on the book, and I really liked your courage through writing it, how honest you were about various aspects of your life and drugs and, and how you felt. Uh, and I also like your bold move of starting off with going to your first sex party at PEX. <laughs> I thought that was a great way to start. I know. <laughs> I couldn't resist. It helped. It helped for everybody, I think, to get into the mood of it. Mm. Um, but I want to know, before we get into the material of the book and what you learned there, when did you first hear about drugs when you were young? And what was the vibe around them like? Well, I first heard about drugs when I was young by reading the New York Times, an article, uh, I don't remember if it was above or, or below the fold, uh, back in, I think it was 65, uh, about these three Harvard professors who just got fired for giving drugs, to, psychedelic drugs to their students, people named uh, Dr. Timothy Leary, uh, Dr. Ralph Metzner, and, Ms. and Dr. Alpert, and Richard Alpert. And um, I thought this was like, this was odd. Um, interesting, uh, interesting, they were giving drugs to their students. And uh, I grew up at a time where it was um, uh, basically a, a time where you only uh, uh, only bad people in the wrong crowd got involved with drugs. At least that's what we were taught. Mm -hmm. uh, the the old stereotype of uh, the guy in the trench coat hanging out in the schoolyard saying, "Hey, kid, come over here. I wanted I want to show you something." You know, that type of nonsense. And but but then I I I learned that once I started making friends who were uh, who, who were hippies uh, in in high school that uh, the people who were drawn to a class of drugs known as psychedelics were the brightest uh, and the most fun people I ever wanted to meet and. I was a nerd. I, it was my way to get in with the in crowd, uh, to just hang out with them. Uh, and they accepted me, unlike other more straight kids who just looked down on me for being a nerd. And I wasn't into sports or, or cars, or, or, and I wasn't popular with the girls. But the psychedelic kids was, just embraced me with open arms and um, were just curious about my opinions and what I had to say. And uh, so it was a whole different milieu around psychedelics. And one of the images you made in the book, I really liked, you said that if in the mid sixties, if there's a radar screen for counterculture activity based in Manhattan, they'd only pick up a couple of blips in little towns like yours out on the Island. And so I think it's hard 
today for young people to fathom how the feeling of the 60s began in 1965 and how 63 and how much it swept the nation so quickly. Yes. What was it like to watch that happen, such a revolution so fast? Well, for me, it was thrilling because, like I say, I was sort of in the out crowd um, and not very popular. Uh, and when the counterculture came to town in 65 and 66, suddenly it was all reversed. I was in the in crowd, and the people who were in the in crowd, the jocks uh, and, and others that we called the greasers and the, the people, uh, the cheerleaders and, and the, uh, the future leaders of America, um, <laughs> were suddenly on the outside looking in and wanted to be like us. Uh, but they were suddenly like Dylan's Mr. Jones. You know, they knew something was happening here, but they didn't know what the hell it was. And so for me, it was thrilling to suddenly be uh, in with the in crowd and and uh, and be in a, in a group of people who were curious and uh, exploratory and open-minded and questioned absolutely everything. And so this, this, this cultural tsunami that swept across the country in, in a matter of months uh, changed everything for, for kids like me. And suddenly you could tell who your friends were and who your enemies were just by looking at them because the hairstyle at that point meant everything. So if a kid had long hair, you knew so much about him before you even opened your mouth. Uh, and you knew that uh, he'd be a friend. And when I went out a few years later to hitchhike around the country, it was such a polarized situation. And I was hitchhiking through the South uh, at, 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 at for a time. And uh, most cars, they kept passing me by and wouldn't pick me up if, if a tornado was coming. <laughs> but if a long-haired guy, or we called him, we called each other freaks at the time, affectionately, uh, was passing by, they wouldn't, they would never pass by, uh, and they'd always stop and and give me a ride. And so it was quite an amazing time that lasted for a few short years, but gave me a solid experience of what it could be like to feel connected with a tribe of people who were thinking more, not just about themselves, but thinking about the whole world and caring about the whole world and beyond just our selfish little, 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 little uh, worlds. And we're really interested in racial equality and social justice and denuclearization and bringing peace to the world, and bringing love to the world. It was like, wow, this was something new and astonishing and daring. And the reverberations are still being felt. I appreciate one thing you said in there about your sympathy for the parents of the hippies and the freaks, that it's easy for us to sympathize now with the hippies, but to be a parent of someone who was rejecting everything you've ever thought was true but mostly because of this new drug and how scary an experience that was. Yes. The new drug, of course, was LSD. And I love that we called it acid because it helped us burn through the BS all around us. And it made the powers that be uh, not only the, the uh, patriarchy, but um, the, the governmental powers, the, the, the clergy uh, the, the police and law enforcement, our teachers, all those who uh, were in positions of authority, it made them look ridiculous to us. We laughed at them, which was traumatizing for them. Their kids were turned by this one chemical called, called LSD. Uh, it, it seemingly against them and against everything they believed in, whether that was capitalism or religion or, or whatever. And so it was traumatizing for them and scary as hell. And so, as I say in the book, uh, within a few short years, they reacted by putting Nixon in the White House and uh, Tim Leary in the jailhouse and psychedelics in the shithouse. Uh, that they did. And so 
since your book is about relationships and you're and you're a therapist as well in this in your first phase here with this type of drugs what did you what do you remember learning about what psychedelics and entheogens in general could do for uh, romantic relationships and platonic friendships well uh, like it like it did with my friends uh, it gave us something that we shared on a very deep an esoteric level. Uh, we had this secret bond. Uh, we saw the same things uh, when we tripped. We, we, we pierced the veils of reality and saw the absurdity of, of, of the world, which gave us a, a, a sense of bonding that was very, uh, very special and really lifelong. Uh, as far as romantic relationships were concerned, um, I didn't trip with a lover too often at the time. It was more thereafter, it was more afterwards. It was really, that didn't really start for me, honestly, until I met Shelley in the year 2000. Uh, and, and we started experimenting together, especially with MDMA. So in the 60s, I didn't really have romantic experiences uh on drugs unfortunately so your story of falling in love with shelly is so sweet in there and i very much appreciated your advice about not taking your own laundry list of what you want in a partner too seriously and i was wondering if you could share a little bit more on that of just how how that happened and how and what you learned there shelly blew my mind um uh, because uh, I, I, I just wanted to be with her because it was fun to be with her. I uh, just wrote her off from the start uh, uh, as being the potential for me of, of being a long-term relationship because she didn't meet my laundry list, which had to do with somebody who was psychologically sophisticated or an intellectual. Uh, Shelley was intelligent, but not an intellectual. Uh, was somebody who was politically savvy. Shelley was none of those things. Somebody who was um, uh, in, into seeing that relationships were drama and struggle. Uh, and with Shelley, it was just easy. So she wasn't satisfying my need for drama and struggle. All she was doing was making me happy. And it took me a while for my head to catch up to my heart. My heart fell in love with her the first night but my head took a while for it to say what you mean like what i you mean relationships can be fun happy easy joy and play and fun could be the basis of a relationship who knew i didn't know and when i realized that it was like it was like the, the easiest lesson of my life and I realized that i was completely head over heels in love with her uh, and it took me a while to realize that, but when I did, then I just wanted to get as close to her as I could and uh, wound up uh, wound up marrying her. I don't know why she went along with that, but she says she's having a good time too, so who am I to question that? <laughs> and one of the things that have led that good time is now this shared interest in psychoactives. But I think in the beginning, you had that common um, issue where you were still interested in, in mind expanding drugs, but she wasn't that experienced and was a little wary. So what advice would you have for people who might have one partner who's more interested and another who isn't quite as sure if this is good for themselves or good for the relationship? Go gentle on them. Nobody wants to be proselytized to, and nobody wants to be told what they should do. Um, and uh, you know that, and I know that. So um, the best way to persuade a partner to do these substances is to do them yourself and enjoy them and get a lot out of them and share your own experience without pushing them in the least. And hopefully they'll come around uh, and the best way for them to come around is with MDMA, uh, because, which is, of course, what my, my book is about. I call it the chemical of connection uh, because it helps one connect with 
oneself and a partner and, and the world at large, it's the gentlest of all these drugs. It's very difficult to have a bad experience on MDMA. Uh, it happens, uh, especially if you don't know how to do it right, but um, it's the most user-friendly and it, uh, the best and easiest introduction to the uh, psychedelic pantheon. And also, um, uh, you can gently, you know, uh, suggest that uh, there are a couple of books that, that they could read if they wanted. Uh, Michael Pollan's How to Change Your Mind is a great introduction. And most people who read that book are not going to take psychedelics. They're just curious about them. And it's a very good read. And um, and I know you could uh, get them my book. And people are enjoying that one too. So They are. I did. <laughs> um, and I, what I liked is it was so many great stories and also a lot of really solid practical advice. And so mm -hmm. I was going to ask if you were going to have a first experience sharing MDMA with a partner, how would you set it up? What kind of um, th uh, things would you put in place uh, between yourselves interpersonally, as well as how you would set up the space? Well, the mantra in our community is set and setting. So the set is the mindset going in. So I would say to the partner, well, what I said to Shelly uh, at the first time, and she was very willing to try it, uh, I said, you know, let's let's talk before we do this about what you want out of the experience, what you expect, um, what your intentions are, any fears that you have. Just get it all out in the open, um, and just just to listen to your partner, and just be uh, neutrally listen and just receive them and understand what they're saying and. Um, calm their fears uh, if if uh, it's appropriate to do so, and um, encourage them to you know just go with the ride. The setting is the physical uh, setting, uh, the surroundings, uh, and that's important to have uh, a setting of where where you feel safe, completely safe. So home, uh, if you can just be be to have the two of you. In, a, in, 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 in your home alone, uh, that's the safest setting. And then you can have an option to go outside if you feel like it during the experience, but you're going to let the medicine guide you, uh, guide you through that. And uh, any intentions you set, you have to let them go once you drop uh, the medicine and, and uh, wait for it to come on because you don't know where it's going to take you. Uh, you have to go with with, with with what it takes you, where it takes you. So am I answering your question? Absolutely. And the next one is going to be similar. What what can people expect? Why is it such a positive experience? And why do you advocate as this being often helpful for people's relationships? Well, yeah, I, I do like to call it uh, emotional superglue for relationships because that's what it's been for Shelley and I and for others that we know. Uh, and so um, uh, you're, you're asking, um, why, do I, why do I say this? It, 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 well, just well, take a moment to, to look at the chemistry. Um, what happens is MDMA floods the system with serotonin, your own serotonin. Uh, and oxytocin and, and, and dopamine as well, I believe. And the result is that you have a, a feeling of complete safety and well-being. For the person who's doing it the first time, as you're climbing, you might feel a little disoriented at the beginning for a few minutes, 5, 10, 15 minutes. Um, you might get a little dizzy. Um, and of course, scared because you've never done this before, but then you hit the plateau that lasts for several hours and this feeling of immense well-being and safety and joy often. Um, and so to share that, to be so chemically, exquisitely attuned, uh, with, uh, with your partner, uh, together, 
uh, is is an, an uncan uncanny experience, and uh, and then you can do whatever you want. You can play. You can talk. Uh, you can uh, be sensual with each other. Though I must say that for many people, uh, uh, MDMA is not a sexual drug, uh, and if you're having uh, if you're doing it for the first time with your partner, I wouldn't bring sex into it at the very beginning because let them explore what this is like for them. Often, um, I've seen people with uh, doing MDMA for the first time and what they really want to do is cocoon. They want to wrap themselves in a blanket often for a few hours to just like, you know, what is this? What's going on? And And this is fascinating. Let me work with this. Um, and this feels good, and well, let me explore this on my own for a few hours. That's often what happens. So if your partner wants to do that, you should allow the space for them to do that. But then they'll probably come out of it and want to talk. It's great for talking and bringing things down to a, a deeper level than you might normally relate on. That's beautifully said. And... I was curious about your opinion of some of the other major drugs in terms of connection. You know, if, if you'd suggest starting with MDMA, once a couple's experienced that sometimes and wanted to try some of the others, which others uh, do you think are worth exploring and, and what it's like between a couple with an intentional, for an intentional experience? Hmm. Well, um, first I need to say, Lex, that... Uh, I am speaking as somebody who is an expert, but really, to be honest, I'm an expert in my own experience. Uh, I'm not a I'm not a doctor. Uh, I, I'm not giving medical advice. These substances are still illegal uh, and potentially dangerous. So I just need to say that um, uh, I'm really talking about my own experience and my wife's experience and the experience of many of our friends. So that's to always be taken into consideration. Um, but uh, after Shelley and I ex uh, experimented with MDMA, we also experimented with mushrooms, psilocybin, and LSD. And these are completely different th than MDMA. These are hallucinogens. And uh, the, they can open up a whole world between two people. For one thing, <laughs> Shelly likes it. <laughs> I'm going to share something a little intimate here. I hope you don't mind. But Shelly likes to quote me. At one point, we were in the middle of the act uh, on our first uh, acid trip. And Shelley remembers me saying to her, because we were both enthralled, and she was, remembers me saying to her, this is sex on acid, baby. <laughs> <laughs> because it was just extraordinary. Um, there's nothing like sex on LSD, as far as I'm concerned. Not everyone feels that way, however. Um, so there's that. But it's always been the case for me and, and, and for Shelly and I. Um, but also, uh, um, we're, you know, um, sharing these optical experiences that we're having. Music can sound uh, ex ex extraordinary, astonishing on, on LSD. And to share that together can be amazing. Um, and of course, then there's the insights that can come and um, just traveling inwardly together. It's the world's best staycation as far as I'm concerned. So at CV Sciences, we've been perfecting our immune support formula for quite a while. And now it's time for the big reveal. It's called CV Acute. It's actually CBD free and it's very different from typical immune products. CV Acute comes in a small bottle containing just enough for three servings per day for three days. It's for when you're just starting to feel off or when you're in a situation where you might not be able to social distance like on an airplane. CV Acute is based on a famous prescription from Chinese medicine. It combines the fruit of the forsythia, 
the root of the bico skull cap, and the flower of the honeysuckle. The World Health Organization has studied this formula and called it one of the leading seasonal support formulas on the planet. So how does it work? I'm glad you asked because I spent days and days and days researching that question. I never knew much about traditional Chinese medicine, mostly because as a biochemist, it was too damn complicated. Hundreds of plants combined in thousands of different preparations. It's exactly what makes a reductionist scientist throw up their hands in horror. If you look up for Scythia, for instance, in traditional Chinese medicine, it's included in 114 different preparations and prescriptions, and it's been used for over 4,000 years. It's often referred to as one of the 50 fundamental herbs in traditional Chinese medicine. And when studying it, scientists have found over 200 different compounds inside with a wide range of positive effects. Just look up for Scythia, Honeysuckle, and Bico skull cap to see a flood of information. So whenever you think your immune system might be getting a challenge from something, take CV Acute and spend three days kicking some ass. Use the coupon code LEXFILES at cvsciences.com to try CV Acute for immune support. That's LEXFILES at cvsciences.com for your bottle of CV Acute. With those descriptions, it almost sounds like MDMA is the one for a couple to go inward to each other, and LSD and mushrooms are ones to go outward together on a journey. I wouldn't necessarily put it that way. Um, I know what you mean, um, but actually MDMA beckons me outward. Um, yes, it, it helps me connect with myself, but it really beckons me to connect with whoever I'm with uh, and, and just relate to them, um, if not completely hug them and, <laughs> and, and just be uh, so happy to be in their presence and let them know that. Um, so it's, I wouldn't, uh, that, for me, that's an oversimplification of uh, um, what, what you're saying, um, uh, though that might be your experience. <laughs> Um, I like binaries. I grew up in the church. Um, okay. <laughs> and, but no, what, what you're saying makes sense. And it also makes sense of something else you talk about in the book about going outward with MDMA, how much you found you enjoyed electronic dance music and other types of music and what it was like for you and Shelly to combine MDMA and dancing. Can you tell us more about that and any recommendations for how to make it better? It's thrilling. Um, uh, and I, I have to, you, you haven't referred to this uh, yet, but I need to share that I'm 71 years old. My wife is 69. And, uh, for us, you know, when we started doing this, it was 20 years ago, still in, in our fifties and then up and through our sixties for us to have an experience of dancing, like, uh, we were half our age because of the this feeling of of utter vitality that was coursing through our bones and our veins was um just euphoric uh, and for me it's just it was a revelation that this 40 year old 30 year old 20 year old charlie was still in there just wanting to let loose and celebrate and no better way to do that with MDMA, in my opinion, than with EDM, electronic dance music, uh, and to dance together <laughs> at at a rave or 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 just at home uh, can be uh, just a, a marvelous experience. I also like how you said that EDM music, which is normally known as electronic dance music, could just as easily stand for everybody's doing Molly, <laughs> right. <laughs> And it really speaks to how ancient this is in human societies and human tradition to get twisted on something, anything, whatever's around, even if it's just breathe, uh, breathing techniques and dancing together as a group, yes. and that we're coming back into this. And so you have this big network in New York, and you you two are, are godparents to a lot of, of people in New York around this community. It's a beautiful thing. Can you talk about how this might feel? feel like a spiritual community, how this might feel like somebody's uh, mosque or synagogue or church just to be in this group? Well, before I get to the spiritual, let me say something else that I, I neglected to say a minute ago about dance, which is it taught me 
being with Shelley and also dancing with Shelley on MDMA taught me how fun and play and joyful celebration can in themselves be transformative experiences. And I never knew such a thing could, could be true. And so that's where we get into the spiritual because I always thought uh, – of a spiritual life and spiritual pursuit as being quite stern and serious. And of course it can be, and at times needs to be, but that's not the only aspect of it. Spiritual existence and pursuing that existence can be a joyful pursuit as well. And that was a revelation to me. And what these substances do for me is they make me realize that my sense of being a separate entity cut off from the rest of the human race because of my own personal personality and my own whatever shame I carry as a human being, whatever guilt I carry, all my neuroses, all that is just an illusion. It's just not important that in reality, we're all made of the same stuff and we all have much more in common than we have differences. And what we have in common is much more important than our differences. And that's the beginning of a spiritual awakening for me. And these substances help me see that because when you're high on any one of these substances, the ego dissolves temporarily while you're high. Uh, and, uh, And it's like the veil's dropping and it's like, suddenly coming to and awakening and realizing like, oh, I've just been trapped in my own head, my own ego, my own body ego, thinking of myself as a separate person with my own thoughts and worries and concerns. But there's this whole world that I belong to, that I belong with, Uh, a world of humans, a world of, of living things, a world of nature, the whole universe. I'm a part of it all, and as deserving as anyone of love and happiness. And that's uh, these these compounds are are tools for that kind of awakening. And maybe to switch and put on your therapist hat, but still in that same vein of ideas. What do you see these do for the healing, uh, maybe not among your patients uh, per se, but among the people around you from the emotional therapeutic angle of what these mm. do? Yeah, I, I don't, uh, I, I wish I could uh, have run medically assisted uh, 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 sessions, but I don't. Uh, I practice sober and my patients are sober during the se- sessions. Do so I look forward to the time when we can legally uh, do that because um, I could do, for example, six months worth of couples counseling in a day uh, with a couple that I'm doing, uh, that I'm guiding them through an MDMA experience because it helps them, like I say, dissolve the egos and the conflicts between them suddenly become something that they can look at from a softened, more open-hearted place. And MDMA, you know, when it was first being uh, distributed on on the West Coast, when it was still legal in the 70s, the therapists got a hold of it and they gave it a, a name. They called it empathy. And they gave it to their couples saying this drug is called empathy, you should try it, uh, because it, it helps you feel what it's like to be in the other person's shoes um, and uh, feel you feel empathy and compassion. And these can be, of course, very healing experiences for couples and individuals as well uh, to start with feeling compassion for oneself and one's own plight uh, and gain a whole new perspective on one's mental um, goblins and one's inner demons uh, and realize that, yeah, I might have these uh, problems, but I don't need to define myself this way. These are problems I have that I can work with, but I don't have to get sucked in down down the rabbit hole every time these demons emerge and I can hold them gently 
and look at them and uh, and see them for what they are, which is really teaching tools. That's what they are. That's what all these inner goblins are, is is teachers that uh, and and ways of growing. And so psychedelics in the right circumstance with a, a th- with somebody who can guide you through the experience can uh, help you grow in these ways. For couples using this, just to play devil's advocate for any sure. skeptical listeners, it what if people are just getting high in the experience, exchange, getting this love boost, but then it goes away? You know, what, what prevents this from being just a, a flash of light versus a sustained glow? Great question. Uh, the real trick to any of these experiences is afterwards. It's the integration. Integration is the key, and that's not easy. That's the hard work, the work of turning these states into traits and learning to uh, weave these insights and revelations into one's life. And that's an ongoing process. Uh, For me, meditation is a great tool to do that. Uh, and and uh, it's helped my meditation practice and helps help encourage my meditation practice uh, and and it's helped me uh, uh, go to uh, this uh, quiet place where my thoughts are thank God tuned tuned out or turned tuned down for a little while. I think the next one would be what specific advice on integration would you have for couples who are doing this what what to do the follow-up work? To understand that the, the follow-up is work. Uh, and it would be great, for example, the best I would recommend is to have a couple session with a psychotherapist uh, at the ready a few days after you have a, an, a, an experience with, um, for example, MDMA. So you could go there and talk about and process the feelings and, and, uh, and information that came up during the experience. Uh, but you also, uh, if you're not therapeutically inclined, uh, um, you might want to understand that the two of you may need to have sober uh, time together every week just uh, to connect in a special way, to just take time, to have no distractions, to have real quality time with each other. Um, it could be around making love, but it could just be around talking and and connecting and feeling each other's heart. Uh, that's uh, one thing that these medicines have taught me is that, oh, you can carve out several hours uh, several times a year to live in a different way and 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 have a, a time apart from one's normal life. Uh, and you know people who celebrate the, the Jewish or the Christian Sabbath understand these things uh, that uh, this is a time apart and makes it makes uh, uh, a, a day that's 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 special that you think about, higher things um, and it's a way of of uh, uh, of getting in touch with what's really important and that can infuse and inform the rest of your week and your life well that's really good advice challenging too I have to take that one home unfortunately um, oh these are tough ones it is challenging because uh, we're you know we have our habits and it's hard to change our, our habits and and to uh, especially if, uh, like yourself, you have kids and and, uh, and there's so much to do all the time and and so many distractions and it's hard to find that that time to and and to carve out that time every week. I'll, I'll tell you something else, uh, uh, if I may. Uh, Shelley and I have this ritual that we established. It's the simplest thing in the world, but it's made all the difference. At the end of our day, we share. And the way we do it is is uh, first one person will go, doesn't matter who goes first. 
And for example, she'll go first sometimes and she'll just tell me about her day and I will just listen. And it might take five minutes, it might take 20 minutes, and she'll tell me everything that she wants to share with me about what happened during her day. And my job is to just listen, not solve her problems unless she's asking for advice, um, uh, not uh, try to change anything, um, but just listen. And when she's done, after uh, as long as it takes, then we switch. And I tell her about my day and all the details that I want to convey. And she listens. And it keeps us connected throughout the week. And it's a very simple but very special connection ritual that, that works for us very well. I like that. And it actually reminds me of one that uh, my wife Claire and I learned from Stan Tatkin. He, he had this order and, you know, he's a bit of a bully when it comes to relationships. And he said, you have to go to bed together. You have to put each other to bed. I don't care that you like to stay up later or whatever. Mm. It doesn't work with your schedule. Um, it's your job as a partner to put each other to bed. Mm. It's, it's more important than you realize in terms of rhythm. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I didn't like that one. I like going, I like being, uh, going to bed late, but it, it did help a lot. Um, yeah. And so I, I, I really like this. And the other thing, to change gears a little bit, you talked about the importance of doing your own work on yourself. And you wrote some about uh, your own men's group. And I wondered if you wanted to just share on the importance of that for you and the importance of people finding something for themselves, for their emotional and or spiritual development that might be apart from their partner, but is in service to the relationship in a sense. Yes. Um, I am a big believer in support and in, in group support, people in the same boat as you. Uh, and for me personally, this, uh, this may not uh, apply to everyone, but I have found same-sex support to be uh, just uh, a tremendous blessing in my life. I've been in and out of men's groups all my adult life. They've made all the difference. And what we do, I have this bunch of men who, are, there's six of us all together, and we meet every week and we support each other with our goals, with our relationships, uh, and we also joke around. And these are men who know me inside and out. I withhold nothing from them. They know more about me than anybody. Uh, and... Uh, and they call me on my BS if I am, you know, if I have that. And, and it's been a great um, support for my marriage because uh, if I'm angry at, at Shelly for something or if I'm going through something with her, I'll bring it to them and, and talk to them about it. And half the time, or more than half the time, actually, they say, Charlie, get over yourself. Uh, you know, you're taking yourself way too seriously or you're taking what you said personally or this or that and because they know I can take things personally. And they set me straight so I can then bring my best self back home. And so it's uh, it's been a, a tremendous blessing for me. You know, in the past, uh, relationships were never meant to just be about two people. It always as I like to say, it takes a, a village to raise a relationship. And uh, through millennia, in all cultures, it's been the, the larger family and the, and, the, and the tribe and the community and the congregation that has supported the marriage. Uh, but in Western society, at least in, in this country, uh, in America and in and, and a, and a town like New York City, a lot of people think, no, it's just you and me against the world, babe. Um, we don't need anybody else. And that can be dangerous for a, a, a relationship uh, because you're, you're putting too many of your social needs uh, onto one person and the relationship can, can, can collapse under its own weight. You need support from friends and, and family, or at least certain family members that you can trust uh, who, are, who are, can give wise counsel. Uh, we all need that. I sure do. Before I let you go, if this conversation intrigued anyone listening to experiment with these 
drugs and relationship deepening. Do you have any last words of advice for them? Well, um, yeah. <laughs> um, Besides buy the book. <laughs> <laughs> because I'll tell you, buy the book. Because um, no, you don't have to buy. The, my book has a, a guide to safe use. Um, uh, which I, I, I worked very hard on, but you could also find that information online, like uh, at uh, on irawid.com and other places. You need to know what you're doing going in. Uh, you really need to be careful. All these, these are very powerful medicines. They can do a world of good, but they can also be, uh, you can feel like Mickey Mouse at uh, playing Sorcerer's Apprentice. Uh, if you don't know what you're doing, uh, and if you get in over your head, um, it, it, it can be a harrowing experience. So you really need to educate yourself uh, before doing this alone or with somebody else. That's good advice. And it reminds me, one thing I feel compelled to share is that everybody has an Achilles heel psychoactive that doesn't work for them. And for mm. instance, mine is MDMA. Um, mm. I think it has an amphetamine component, an upper component. Yes. And so for me, uh, the love, lovey dovey part doesn't hit me nearly as hard as the jitters of being very, very uh, speedy. And it just makes for an unpleasant experience for May me. May I make a suggestion? Yes. Um, well, may maybe you've done this before. Maybe you've tried this. Um, of course, I've heard this you know, about, you know, 10 or 20% of the people who try MDMA have this experience. And a matter of fact, I know somebody who was so wanting to turn their partner on to MDMA, uh, I said to, to share it with them, and they did. And their partner was saying, uh, like, uh, this is too much. I'm, this is overwhelming, and I, I just want to walk around and shake it off, and when will it end? And um, it was very unpleasant. So I advised this person, just as a friend, said, next time you do it together, if you can persuade your partner to do it a second time, don't give them the full 120 milligrams. Give them 80. And they did, and it was magical, he said. It was just extraordinary. They had a wonderful time, and they want to do it again. So... I don't know if that if that if mm -hmm. that can apply to you, if you've ever tried doing less. Yeah, it is worth considering, especially with the data from Maps um, being uh, for their therapy. That sometimes seventy five for certain types of people that they're testing MDMA on for psychotherapy purposes, seventy five milligrams does better than the standard one twenty five that they use, which That's they weren't right. expecting. They were giving yeah. 75 just to like, you know, show yeah. it didn't work quite as well. Then it yeah. ended up working better. That's right. That's right. Less can be more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As Paracelsus said, the dose makes the poison. That's true. The very last thing I wanted to ask you, right before we started recording, you asked me, and I thought you'd be a good person to ask. So, Charlie, what is the purpose of life? <laughs> <laughs> I was asking you that because before we went on the air, you said, do we have any questions? Do, do you have any questions, Charlie? I said, yeah, what's the meaning of life? Um, uh, I, you know, for me, I, I can't speak for anyone else. Um, uh, ask me in 10 years, maybe I could speak for other people too. But uh, for me, it's all about... Um, being here to help others, uh, that's where I derive a sense of meaning and, and purpose. It's really here to uh, help each other, help each other, and to turn people on to their own higher self and their own inner wisdom and their own true power as, as, as humans, and to help uh, spread the word that, uh, well, as we said, it's hippies. Love is the answer because it really is. Thank you. I'm glad I asked. Thank you for asking. And so for everyone listening, Charlie Winninger's book is Listening to Ecstasy, The Transformative Power of MDMA. Charlie, thanks so much for coming on the show and talking with us today. Oh, Lex, thank you so much for having me on. It was a pleasure. Thanks for tuning in. 
To listen to other episodes, check out pluscbdoil.com, listen on all the podcast platforms, or see us on YouTube. Subscribe to the CV Sciences YouTube channel to see each new episode. And if you'd like to buy any of our fine products, use the coupon code LEXFILES for 25% off. If you have any questions, compliments, or suggestions, feel free to write me at research at cvsciences.com. And please follow the podcast on Twitter at The Lex Files Show, where I try to keep it fun. If you enjoyed this program, please give us a like on your favorite platform or share a link to your social media. It means a lot to us. The Lex Files is produced by Matt Payne. The YouTube videos are by Brendan Cleek. Thank you to Tina Molnar and Jasmine Morris for the visuals. And the music is by Jake Bradford Sharp. Our sponsor is CV Sciences, makers of America's favorite CBD oil. And I'm Lex Pelger, signing off.